So as many of you know, life down here in the Keys can be rather expensive. But if you know where to look, you can do a lot of fun activities on a budget. So today we're here at the Dolphin Research Center on their Love Their Local Day. So entry is free and they're celebrating their 40th year anniversary. Dolphin Research Center is a nonprofit education and research facility. This is a wonderful place to observe a fun-filled behavior session, learn from an educational presentation, join an interactive program, and explore where a family of dolphins, sea lions, and exotic birds all call home. If you have the will and a moment to spare, it's a beautiful world out there. It's a beautiful world out there. Welcome to Dolphin Research Center. Thank you. And how are you today? Good. And there's a table at the bottom of the stairs, a little out to the left, if you could check in with them. Okay. And then head on out and see our family out there. Okay. Do you need this name as well? No. I'm so grateful for Love Our Locals Day because I've been wanting to check this place out for a long time. And how do you say no to free entry and an invite to a dolphin's birthday party? At check-in, we received some free raffle tickets, and then we were greeted by DRC's lovely social media rep, Allie, who basically gave us a private tour of the facility. This poster, there's a little bit about um, probably my favorite study because I just find it really, really cool. And also directed us towards very knowledgeable Abby, who filled us in on all the research performed here by DRC. We wanted a chance to talk to everybody about what the research we do here in-house is. And we do three main kinds. Uh, we can do anything from looking at like learning about medical stuff, healthcare, improving rehabilitation techniques through learning about dolphins physiology. Uh, we also do behavioral research. So looking at behavior, uh, watching in their free time. But most of what this is focused on is cognition. So understanding how they think, how they learn their minds. It's a really neat area. It's something that you can't necessarily study in the wild too. So we do our work in-house here. We also do field research with wild dolphins, but you can't ask a wild dolphin, hey, what did you think about that? You have to have to serve it. Yes, yeah, because it's not the way you think. So instead, you need a way to break that down into an experiment that you can test. So we've done that here with a lot of different projects. Dolphins understanding some mathematic concepts. Okay. What do they understand about less? They could understand it. They could select a less board. What do they understand about hidden objects? Uh, object permanence is an ability tested in human children. They've tested it in a lot of animals, so it's a great way to compare multiple species. It's if I hide this object, do you understand it still exists? Right. Where is it? Can you understand that concept? Uh, but then some of the really, really neat ones, really interesting to dolphins. One of my favorites is imitation. Uh, humans are great imitators. Our kids are great imitators. A lot of other animals don't flexibly, truly imitate. That ability seems to be pretty rare in the animal kingdom, but dolphins are amazing at it. They are excellent imitators. So our dolphins know a little signal for, hey, can you imitate something? Okay. So you do a little chop and can you imitate that? We asked Tanner, could he imitate? He was learning how to wear a blindfold. Uh, the blindfold is totally voluntary. If he doesn't want to wear it, he can blink, it pops, it pops right off. off. Okay. So he doesn't have to wear it if he that's, doesn't feel like it. That's what this cup is. Yes, okay. it's a little suction okay. cup. Uh, but if he's comfortable wearing it and he's interested wearing it, which he's really, really good in he them, he's like fantastic. Learning, yeah. <laughs> we could ask him, hey, can you still copy another dolphin without using your vision? And he could. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's super cool. We even thought that perhaps they are very, very good at listening, hearing. They've got excellent hearing, but they also have active hearing with their echolocation. Right. They emit clicks, receive that back. But what we found is when he imitated another dolphin, He's so good at that, he didn't even need to turn on the echolocation. Really? He could just use his passive Good hearing on more trials. Right? You're really good at this. What happens if we put in a model with a different body plan? Arms instead of flippers, legs instead of a tail. And Tanner could still do it. He could imitate a human in water, but he switched and used more of that echolocation. He was the first ever non-human animal to demonstrate that kind of ability to switch that sensory system in order to get more information to imitate. Dolphins have been seen doing cooperative behavior in the wild, but how much does an animal understand about their partner and teamwork? So to understand in dolphins, we train them a task with two underwater buttons and ask the dolphins, can you press those two buttons? And they had to learn that the success part of the game was pressing them at the same time. So press two buttons within one second of each other. And the first stage was just, can they do this? And they were 
amazing at it. Right. They were averaging within one third of a second in between partner button presses. Oh my God. Yes, incredibly precise, efficient cooperation. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so yes, they super understood it and excelled at it. So the second part is okay. How are they doing that? And we found that they were more successful on trials where they were making whistles. There were whistles so they and were communicating to each other. To yes. The so the third part, which we really were interested in, was okay, if they're using whistles to do this really efficient, really effective cooperation, it has a lot of precision, a lot of timing. What happens if human sound is interrupting that communication? We asked them if they were comfortable. We put an underwater speaker in. Actually, first, we put it in on a boat and brought it in so they could hear it. Once we were sure that they were really comfortable, it wasn't anything too weird. We asked them to play that cooperation game with some trials with noise. And what we found is that the dolphins went from 85% correct when it was just ambient noise, just the background ocean sound, down to 62% in the noise. And specifically, it's not just, oh, it's a bit annoying. It's that they are having trouble cooperating. They're having trouble with this teamwork skill, which for our dolphins just meant they didn't win their games. Right. They still get all their food. We could encourage them. We could keep the it's game not positive. Life or death with them, but it is for right. some others, perhaps. Yes. For a dolphin in the wild, that's fishing. They cooperate and hunt, and that precision timing might be necessarily for getting food together. So going from 85% of the time you're getting a meal to you're expending that same energy, but down to 62%. That's really serious and can help show why we need to make sure that there are quiet spaces for dolphins, that if construction projects are able to do things to make an area quieter, that's critical. Incentive to do that can sometimes be challenging unless you have a way to show, hey, this is what's going on when we don't. And that's again why we can do this stuff here. You can't test this in a wild dolphin. No, they don't understand. Yes, you don't have that trust or anything like that. It's against the law, which is also a great reason. But with ours, we can check back and forth. And we've had research projects where we said, hey, do you think this is cool? And a dolphin says, no, I don't. And that's fine. We'll do, you know, we can do the project with someone right. else if someone else likes it, or we'll scrap the project. Yeah. They come first no matter what. Some days you go down and they tell you, I don't want to think about yeah, research right now. Today. And you scrap it, you play, and that's fine. Your relationship with them comes first. But a lot of them love those puzzles and really find it engaging and interesting too. So on the other hand, sometimes you bring down a cool puzzle for them and they're like, yes, this is exactly what I want to chomp on right now is figure out this game and dissect it and learn about it. All of our work we do, these go into published journals. So it goes in for peer review, outside scientists review our work, make sure the science is sound, can give any edits if that's needed, and then goes to journals for other scientists to use for other scientists to build on, but also for anybody to read. And we have a little code here. If anyone would like to check out uh, on our website, we have a list of the publications since we publish in a lot of different journals. And we also carry that work over and do research with wild dolphins. So anything we learn from them, we can also apply to dolphins in the wild. Find out about wild dolphins. Actually, when's the birthday party? Are we missing that? Five minutes. Oh, do that let's first. do it. Yeah, you guys ready? Right. Yeah, the so, wild dolphin studies too. That's super that's really interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So Jacqueline, what are we doing? It's Tercy's 50th birthday, and that's pretty old for a dolphin, so we're gonna go celebrate that yeah. behind the scenes, I guess. Super the cool milestone. <laughs> These dolphins have not only health care, but preventative right. health care. And food all the time. <laughs> right. They're never they're never short on food, which means they're never short on water. Because they're mammals, they have right. to drink fresh water. Right? Allie tells me about her dedicated team of experts who ensure these incredible marine mammals receive the highest level of care, from specialized diets to enriching activities. These dolphins are thriving in a place where they're loved, cared for, and where their well-being is top priority, all while helping to make a difference in the understanding and conservation of their species. Super special birthday celebration dance party with our ladies out here in Back Lagoons. This is Noel down on the dock. She is going to be hanging out with two of our lovely birthday girls, Percy and Alita, on November 26th, turned 50 years old. He was born here at what is now Dolphin Research Center back in 1973. She was born at what was then called Flipper Sea School. The Dolphin Research Center is getting ready to celebrate our 40th anniversary next year. We were founded in 1984. 
Oh, and here goes Tercy. She's going to be showing off her front dive. Now, sometimes Tercy likes to build a little bit of suspense, but walk, watch out towards the middle. Fan for a common bottle nose dolphin like these ladies. Alvin the Wild is around as a gift in a healthy population. And the average lifespan in human care is 28 to 29. On average, they do live a little bit longer in human care than they do out in the wild. And that is due to the care that they're receiving. Restaurant quality fish, vitamins, extra hydration, health care. Our dolphins get most of their hydration from their fish as well. But we've also found that giving them some extra hydration is really good for them, especially as they get a little bit older, like Miss Tercy. It's really good uh, as their metabolism starts to slow down to flush out their kidneys and their other internal organs. And it really contributes to that longer and healthier life that they can live in human care. Thank you all very much for joining us today on our Locals Day here at Dolphin Research Center. Uh, we really appreciate you choosing to spend your day here with us. We are a not-for-profit, so your support means the world to us. And we hope that by being here today, you're able to learn about dolphins and fall in love with them and hopefully learn about some ways to help protect them and be inspired to protect them out in the wild. <laughs> to the work we do in-house, learning about our dolphins here, we also do field work, so studying dolphins out in the wild. Most importantly, before I get into it, anyone doing research with wild dolphins needs to be permitted by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, uh, specifically through the National Marine Mammal Science. They need to make sure that anyone who's doing this kind of work has a permit. Uh, the reason being that we are going out, we're looking at dolphins in the wild. As doing so, we're boating a little closer to them. Legally, you need to stay 50 yards away from wild marine mammals. We get a permit from the government that allows us to get close to wild dolphins, to study them, to learn more from them. But we are the only permitted group in this region. They're very careful about like how many they give out. You don't want multiple scientists going out. And we report to them when we went out, how many dolphins we saw. And of course, we're also using that info to contribute to science to protect them. So we survey from Robbie's up in Alamorada, if you've been there, all the way down to the Seven Mile Bridge. And within that area, we study the Gulf and Atlantic side. We're looking for how many dolphins are in the area, um, what kind of habitat are they using. The other thing that we've been working on is we work with the Gulf of Mexico Dolphin Identification System. And it's a really cool system that goes all throughout the Gulf. So there's even study sites in Cuba to see are dolphins moving. Uh, do they live here all the time or do they travel to other places? What we've seen is a lot of our dolphins seem to stay fairly in the area right now. It's still something we're learning about. It takes a long time to get this kind of research. We have been able to see a lot of neat stuff over time. Like we've had three generations of wild dolphins that even come by and visit. So this is Edo Juan Ocho. Uh, she is the mom of little Niner here and Niner had a baby in January. So you can keep track and look at things like when babies are born, you know, social stuff. In order to know who's who, we use the fit. You can use like bumps on the front, but also these notches in the back to ID that dolphin. We also use scars. It's a little hard to see in these images, but if you look where the arrows are, you can see she's got full body scars. We don't want a dolphin to get scars, but when they do have them, it's really useful to be able to match those in case they have a dramatic fin change. Things like a shark bite or a boat strike can even take a dorsal fin off. Still looking at things like population structure, in cases like the BP oil spill. You had a massive oil spill. It was really, really a big thing for the dolphins there. But without a lot of science, you might not know how many dolphins lived in your area before this massive event. In which case, even doing a count afterwards 
it doesn't give you as much information. So you want to have a baseline. If something were to happen to the Florida Keys, we have this information already and can use that to check on, hey, what's going on here and what do we need to do to help them and keep them safe. We also have been working with the Marine Order for Research and Action through Environmental Stewardship, better known as Mores. Mores is working with us on a really cool project of flying drones at the same time that we're doing our field ID. Yes, it's really neat work. You can see here what the drone photo looks like. In this photo, you can see here us getting body morphometrics. So looking at the dolphin's body. So lines are just measuring certain areas. Right. Okay. We're looking at the dolphin's body weight and we can look at changes over time, look and see if a dolphin is underweight. But in order to be able to calibrate the morphometrics, we actually had our dolphins here at DRC help us. So they all know how to voluntarily weigh. They hop up on a scale so we can get an, actu an accurate weight on them. And we asked them if they were comfortable. We worked on them first with a fake drone, then with a speaker on a fake drone, eventually building up to the real one. And we're able to get the software calibrated within one pound. So we could test dolphins, help us how to do that, yes. And then we could test it on other dolphins, even dolphins like Jax, who has an injury. We could get that weight within a pound to make sure we're getting really accurate data. And we're also working on developing a technique to use the drone to get a blow sample. We did test that with the DRC dolphin and get a DNA sample from a single exhale. So are you looking for DNA samples or for like lung health or? You can do both. Okay. Uh, so far, what we've been working on, but specifically she was interested in yeah. DNA, oh, uh, looking at stuff. She's also interested in like in epigenetics, but also pathology, oh, yeah, things like that can all be done with that. How do the wild dolphins do with the drone? Does it scare them? We very closely monitor when they do. And even before we fly the drone, we're looking at the dolphins to see if we see a really young baby, like his wave with our newborn. Stay away. We first survey that, make sure, okay, we have the same address. Fly it and continue to do that. Look at the behavior. I've definitely seen them look at it. They have a behavior called sky hopping, where they bring their whole head and ears out of the water and have some sea and ear stuff out. And like a groundhog. They, <laughs> they do look like that. It's a very funny behavior. But it also means that they are looking at that. So, same thing. Once they start doing that, instead of, hey, let's wait, let's not do anything. We time when we're doing stuff like that. Both the drone and the boat. The boat itself is disruptive. Too. Even though we're being careful, we want to keep in mind that all of that, we're in their habitat. And if they start to do stuff to show, they might be, you'll see behaviors like tail slapping, yeah, that's why I don't like this, call it off. They need to be doing their natural social stuff, they need to be staying away from people. And we can be a lot more disruptive than I think we want to realize. So if you're permitted to do research, you can go out and do that, but you're very careful, you're very cautious. If you're not permitted, yeah, keep your distance, admire them. Uh, but don't vote in, because even I think uh, people don't realize how disruptive that can be. And they're amazing. There's so much cool stuff out there to learn about. We won the raffle. We want to meet and greet with the two dolphins here, Diva and Winley. So we're waiting to take our turn to go down and do our syrups and some handshakes. If you enjoyed today's video, give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing so you'll never miss another episode. And we'll see you next Tuesday for another adventure.